procedural hump. The negotiator was patient. He kept his voice even. Once this procedural hump explained, we can begin discussing the claims and the respective merits thereof of each party in this dispute. The negotiator sat at the head of the table. To his left sat a long row of executives with Turlebog Machina of Bertota. On his right sat King Kub, accompanied only by his driver and nephew, Clauto, who did not sit at the table proper, but in a chair against the wall behind King Kub. The king rubbed his thumb and forefinger together nervously. How could he trust this man? He had never met him before. The man might be secretly employed by TMB. Kub glanced back at Clauto. The latter returned his gaze. Moron, thought Kub. He looked at each of the, of the executives on the other side of the table before turning back to the negotiator. Fine, he said. Get on with it. The negotiator, a 38-year-old man who needed glasses, but was get, putting off getting a pair for as long as he could, wondered if what he was seeing was genuine. King Coop appeared to be an alligator man out of some children's educational cartoon. His skin was a bizarre green, like the color of an unripened gourd. Also gourd-like was the man's nose. The, the negotiator couldn't understand how he kept from getting it caught in elevator doors, doors, ceiling fans, window blinds. How did he drink? He couldn't. Not out of a glass, anyway. The strangeness of King Coop's appearance was augmented by his dress, which was clearly an attempt to impress his royalty on those around him. He wore a purple vest, purple velvet vest trimmed in white fur. He had on puffy black pants, apparently also velvet. Instead of a crown on his head, he had a large crown-shaped badge pinned to the left breast of his vest. The negotiator put his doubts and amazement aside, nodded at the king, and took up a piece of paper. Now, as I said before, my name is Franklin Muffin. I work for the Trans World Negotiators Guild. Coob made a note to look into the organization. I am here, continued the negotiator, to work out an amicable and mutual satisfactory settlement between Her Turlebog Machine of Bertota and King Coob. Firstly, I want to know if the following summation of the issue at hand is acceptable to both parties. Did King Coob act in good faith in attempting to carry out the assignment contracted by Turlebog Machina of Bertota? I did prevent him from getting there, King Coob interjected, slamming his hand on the table. You did not, the man directly across the table from Coob fired back. It's not my fault if, please, gentlemen, Franklin Muffin raised his voice. It still radiated dispassionate calm. Let us first decide whether this is the issue at hand. You mean we have to discuss the issue before we can discuss the issue, King Coob sounded disgusted at his niceties. That is guild procedure, Muffin stated. This made no one happy. After some argument, not all of which was unrelated to resolving Muffin's formulation, it was suggested that everyone take a break to cool the atmosphere. Muffin himself, although he did not show it, relished the chance to compose himself. He went to the restroom down the hall and washed his hands and face. While he was drying his hands, Clouto joined him before the mirror over the sink. Hey, buddy, Clouto greeted the neg negotiator. You like this kind of work? I, I'm not really allowed to discuss the ongoing issue outside of the formal meetings, especially not with one of the participants. Oh, I'm not a participant, Cloudo laughed. I'm just here, just in here to see that nobody jumps the king. I see. So what about it, Cloudo pressed? Is this negotiator job a good one? Muffin considered. Actually, this is my first assignment, he confessed. No, really? Cloudo looked stunned. But I've had extensive training, Muffin hastened to add, mock negotiating sessions and many hours of apprenticeship. Well, I think you're doing a hell of a job, Clouto punched the other man gently on the shoulder. Thank you, said Muffin, then added, I really wanted to be a cowboy. Stobler, Stobler, sometimes referred to as Fat Boy in the press, glanced at his face in the mirror as he put on his punishment bracelet. Many people who had only heard of Fat Boy or read of him in the papers in connection with the nickname Imagine Stopler to look something like the sidekick of, of young Indiana Jones in, in the film Last Crusade. In actuality, he was only slightly overweight. In fact, compared to the average American male of his age, he was positively svelte. It has been theorized that Stopler was called Fat Boy due to his own obsession with his weight and his self-deprecating comments on the subject. This theory is bolstered by his use of the punishment bracelet. Whenever Stobler felt he had eaten too much, had, more specifically, known that he was eating too much and yet persisted in his gluttony, only to arrive at a position five or ten minutes later in which he regretted his actions, he would put on the punishment bracelet. 
He was quite candid about what it, what it stood for. The members of the media who followed his actions, and there were more than you would expect who did so, quickly discovered the purpose of the bracelet and watched out for it. Of course, they began to read meaning into other items in Stobler's wardrobe, but they were almost always wrong in their surmises. The bracelet was about two inches wide and made of pink vinyl. It was studded with gold-plated pig's heads and secured with a buckle also plated with fake gold. Stobler had had it made by an acquaintance of his, a woman trying to make it as a clothing designer. How does he know when to take it off? A reporter, who found out about the woman and her connection to the bracelet, asked the struggling designer as she locked up her shop and headed to a local pita and noodle place for lunch. I guess the same way I know it's time for lunch, the woman, whose name was Mobley, replied somewhat ambivalently, meaning that on the one hand she was irritated by the intrusion, but on the other she knew she needed the exposure that such an intrusion could bring. Reluctantly, she removed her sunglasses and smiled at the reporter. I really don't know, Stobler, she paused, wondering if she should have referred to him as Fat Boy, then continued, that well, I do know that he has an excellent taste in jewelry. That ended, ended Mobley's for. That ended Mobley's flirtation with the keepers of fame's doggy door. She continued un unaccompanied to the pita and noodle place and sat in a, uh, took a seat in a booth. The restaurant, called Pocket Full of Lo Mein, had ceilings so high that no one bothered to look past the colorfully painted ventilation ductwork overhead, suspended halfway between the patrons' heads and the flat black vertical terminus. If Mobley had trouble to peer into the upper reaches of the, of the ceiling, however, it is still doubtful that she would have perceived the secret observ observation platform on which Stobler perched, for it was painted as black as the surrounding structure. Stobler himself was also all in black, even to the circles around his eyes. Ah, Mobley, he thought, and made a note of, of his thoughts in a small notebook. You look like a young, black-eyed rabbit, its, uh, its ears down in the display of fearful modesty. If only I was in shape, I think I could confidently approach you with romantic intentions. As is, I would be ashamed to be seen naked by you, and that would lead to bad sex. He watched closely as Mobley ordered, wondering what she would eat. The scent of food at this altitude was vague. He chugged a glass full of cider, vinegar, and winced, pretending that the burning sensation in his stomach delivered drug-like sensations throughout his system. To his horror, he saw a man in the leather jacket join Mobley in, our, in her booth. He couldn't tell exactly, but he seemed to have that tall, lean, piratical look that he envied. Rangy was the word he feared, like a ball player or a rodeo rider. It takes years to transform one's body into the desired shape. Stobler removed his punishment bracelet and dropped it over the side. What's that? a waitress asked as the bracelet hit the floor near the condiments counter. The phantom strikes again, her co-worker Eileen commented. She picked up the bracelet and looked up into the darkness. I think he's moved past stealing baklava. Are we in danger? Norma wondered. Before she, rece before she could receive an answer, however, she was summoned to, the to table 16, where an older gentleman impatiently awaited an explanation. Punch. It sounded like lunch, but it had a different beginning, the sort of beginning that was liable to spray bits of food on other people. That wasn't the sort of meal I wanted. They say I am a contradiction, picky and fastidious, if that isn't a tautology, and yet not exactly neat and square. You won't spray any food on anyone, our host assured me. There are no uh, crackers on the menu, he laughed, looking from me to those standing behind me. Although I didn't look around, I heard responsive titters. I wrinkled my brows. Was this some lame joke on my being from Georgia? Would that I wasn't, I confessed to a friend some moments later. Wait a minute, another interrupted. I thought you didn't have any friends. Again, those responsive titters, as annoying as a cloud of bugs outside the door when someone has turned on the light prematurely. I sighed. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, especially through some misunderstanding. Can we just get on with my, our order, I suggested. I looked into the faces of my table mates. I'm actually hungry for a change. You don't know what real hunger is, Portimo said after we had taken up our menus and begun the perfunctory per perusal. Probably not, I agreed. There are, there, are two, there are two crackers on the menu, I pounced, pointing to the list of soups. Right there, served with oyster crackers. I'm going to subtly indicate this to that guy, I swore, looking about for the guy. He shouldn't have been too hard to spot. He looked just like George Harrison. Real hunger, Portimos continued, is like a rat gnawing inside your belly, and I to know, he added, dropping his menu slightly and looking at us, for I have experienced both, only it wasn't a rat, I heard him say as he brought the menu back up before his face. I had stopped looking for our host and turned my attention to Portimos. 
He was a large individual with a head shaped like some root vegetable native to swampy soil. Thick flowerets of hair dotted his face, giving it the appearance of a landscaped architect's blueprint. He had six eyes, two more or less where a human would expect eyes to be, and four more tiny ones clustered above what passed for a brow ridge. The fingers that grasped the menu were a multiplicity of stringy digits pr pr projecting directly from the cuffs of his shirt. I envied him with with I envied him with shirt. It looked uh, I envied him the shirt. It looked like something a rock star might wear. It looked like the kind of shirt that I would like to wear on the cover of a rock album. It had little head creatures stamped all over it. I described the shirt to Jerry. Stamped, you say? Yes. I got a good look at it, and the images were totally random in their placement, not the way that they would, would be if they had been printed in some textile workshop. Do you think Porter most did the job himself? I don't think so. He is many things, raconteur, arborist, paper hanger, overall jerk, and expert on the occult, but craftsman? I don't think so. These little head creatures intrigue me, Jerry Muse, turning to the window and looking out on the flooded prairie. Well, remember, I droned from the comfort of my high-backed chair, they are but tiny representations of the big or regular-sized creatures roaming the stylized admonitions of the corridor land. I wonder what they're like. I can tell you, Portimus boasted. He settled back in his seat, stuffed with crackers and goose down. I was easing into my job at the port of Calais, trying to grow a mustache just like the one in the photograph of the governor, when one day I was accosted by a group of head creatures, great big things like piles of mashed potatoes, all red and orange and occasionally blue, standing on stumpy little legs. Their bodies were truly nothing but large heads. They surrounded me, demanding to know where I stood on the issue of working men's rights. Well, not knowing exactly where they stood, of course, I took the prudent course of action and diverted their attention with a cunning stratagem. I pretend, pretended to wave to my friend the governor, supposedly standing in the distance, and when they turned to locate this witness to their bullying tactics, I ducked into a warehouse full of cases of Hawaiian punch, brand fruit, punch, drink. Hawaiian punch, did you say? I grimaced, looked turning around. Oh, Jerry, I've got to. Spool. Jerry helped me roll the giant spool of cable across the lawn. When we reached the edge where the sorghum field began, we still had plenty of cable left. Well, Jerry asked, do we turn around and cross the yard or we keep going? I looked back. We had started in the front yard, took a turn around the house, crossed the backyard, and now stood panting in the morning sun. We'll keep going, I decided. We've got enough cable to make it to the horizon. Besides, I think it'd be best to be as far away as possible if this thing goes off prematurely. I thought that was the whole idea. I want to finish the book, Jerry, not us with it. We started pushing our, again. It was hard before, but now it was harder. The sorghum came up to our knees. This stuff is about ready to harvest, Jerry commented. Looks like it. I really don't know how tall sorghum gets. I don't think I've ever seen it get, get taller than this. Have you ever studied sorghum? I do lots of stuff when you're not around. When am I ever not around? I was wearing gloves, yet I was still careful. I didn't want to get splinters in my hands. What are you going to do with this spool when we're done, Jerry asked. I thought about making something out of it. Why, you want it? Yeah, Jerry panted. I want to make a picnic table out of it. These spools were quite common when I was a child. They used them on playgrounds a lot. It reminds me of something on Sesame Street. Yeah, these and those steel barrels with holes cut in them. Walls made out of differently colored doors, I laughed. Well, I laughed as much as I could, given how hard I was breathing. What if Buck and Mercedes discovered the cable? Jerry asked, after a dozen or so more two turns of the spool. I don't know, I admitted. I tried not to think about it. I thought planning was going to be your watchword. I didn't have an answer for this. Sometimes you just want to do something, Jerry. Yeah, but what if you want to do something you need? I, Jerry, I cried. This is a gestural thing. You just do something zen-like. It's my philosophy. I stopped pushing. There's only a little bit of cable left on the spool. I stretched my back. Give me a minute to see where we are, I said. I looked around. The house was not visible. All around were magenta and green stalks of sorghum. Ahead of us was the beginning of the trees. I wish we could have made it to the trees. I shook my head. Maybe if we hadn't wasted that extra bit of cable going around the house, Jerry suggested. I didn't know precisely what I was doing when we started. Besides, that gives us just that little extra, bit of extra time Something do, do, if someone does discover the cable. Jerry shook his head. That doesn't make any sense. If they see what's at the end of the cable, maybe the cable itself is explosive, I suddenly thought. Jerry said nothing. He looked back towards the house as if imagining a ball of flame filling the sky. Remember, Jerry, this is just a contingency plan. Contingency against what? Your inescapable boredom? Your unassailable laziness? You're not my conscience, Jerry, so back off. Just once, I wish you'd follow through on what you say you're going to do. Enough! 
I stood up tall, authoritative. Or I'll blow this whole damn thing up right now. I shoved the spool so that it rolled forward over a hump and dropped into a depression out of view. The end of the cable fell to the ground. Everything is proceeding according to my design. I couldn't have planned things better if I tried. Rubble Shack Pleat and Mathras tried calling Angelica's parents in Minnesota, but they claimed not to have seen or heard from the daughter in two years. She's a wild one, Angelica's mother lamented. Well, listen, Pleat interjected. If you hear from her, please tell her I've got to have my manuscript back. I'm assuming she's got it. How do you know her again? The mother seemed not to understand the importance of Pleat's request. Of course not, he thought as he hung up. What did it matter to her, or anyone else for that matter, if his work disappeared, never to be seen again? He might as well drive over to her house again, see if she has turned up. As he drove, his thoughts about his, he thought about the possibility that she had, didn't have the book that someone else did. What if it was someone he had written about? Someone he had written unfavorably, that is, truthfully, about. Perhaps even now he was being passed among his friends and associates like Herod the spy, Herod's spy notebook. Would they all form an anti pleat club? He might, have to quite, he might have to quit his job and leave town. It was a romantic no notion, actually, one that appealed to him. If he could secure the manuscript, the story of his ostracism might make getting it published easier. The story of life in a small town, so shocking that its author had to leave that small town. Pleat could see that written on the cover, along with the cover art. It would be a painting of a big man in a beard being run out of town by its hateful residents. They would be throwing stuff at him. Rocks, beer cans, dead cans. Too bad that he didn't actually, he didn't actually feature much in the story as a character. Why don't you just rewrite it? An imaginary interviewer, someone who looked alternately like his own twin and some sort of generic journalist from a magazine like Playboy, asked him from the passenger seat of the car. Because parts of it are so good that I couldn't summon them up again. Why don't you just print up another copy from your computer? From my what? Your computer. I don't know about you fancy journalists out there at the Playboy mansion, but computers are for NASA and the Department of Motor Vehicles. What year is this supposed to be? No time to answer that, however convenient a plot device it might be, for not only did Pleat Mathras not believe in plots, per se, but he was coming up on Jellica's house. Only, it wasn't there. What the hell? He pulled into an empty lot across the street and jumped out. All of the little houses that had been so painstakingly restored only a couple of years ago were either demolished or being demolished. Going to put up apartments, one of the men doing the demolition told him. Just what this town needs, thought Pleat. More apartments. He walked over to the smear of mud and debris that had been Angelica's house. All those dioramas she had installed. All that work. All gone. She had been dead wrong about the longevity of her work. No one cared. Scanning the wreckage, Pleat spotted a little figure from one of the dioramas. It was made of painted wood, probably hand-carved. He picked it up. It looked like... <laughs> Could it really be? Home run, Malone? Pleat put the figure in his pocket and returned to his car. You'll just, you'll just have to start over, the reporter, who now looked like Julio Cortazar, told him. It'll be an out-and-out -out novel this time, Pleat decided. What will you call it? Oh, hell, I don't know, Pleat growled as he started the car. Because, you know, a really great title is, impl is important. Hey, man, do you think you could change into somebody else, maybe like John Barth or Kurt Vonnegut? Hmm, how about this? And the interviewer template became Italo Calvino. However, Pleat didn't like this form either. He turned on the radio and drowned any further attempts at conversation on behalf of his inner self. He noted that as he topped the hill that demarcated the line between his past and downtown, the full moon, full moon was in his reviewer. Would it be a whole year until such a phenomenon was repeated exactly? Beryl. A group of kids riding their bicycles out in the sandy waste that surrounded the town discovered the barrel. As it was heavy, they thought it might contain something valuable. They hammered at the lid for nearly ten minutes before it finally came off. At first, the kids thought it was full of fur coats. The police probably wouldn't have taken the kids seriously if they hadn't been accompanied by their parents. It's an ape, said Louis Gif Gifford, Phil's father. A chimpanzee, I think. Dad, are we going to get a reward? Phil asked his father as they exited the police station. I doubt it, replied his father, not unless some zoo desperately needs its chimpanzee back, dead or alive. I bet you it was one of them talking apes, apes, Todd Cransdale, one of the policemen, said to his comrade Luke Apatow as they drove the barrel and its contents back to the station. What makes you say that, Apatow, whose mind was on his own son, nearing the age when he would start riding a bicycle all over the damn place, asked in response. I don't know, Cransdale said slowly, like a detective in a movie, just a feeling I got. 
In truth, Cransdale had mentioned the idea of the body being that of a talking ape because he had seen a news report only the day before about the advent of the talking apes and their increasing numbers. Back at the station, however, Captain Ramsey took one look at the body and ordered the men to take it to the cor coroner's office. The barrel he sent to the evidence room. That's no animal, Ramsey told Sergeant Bow. Indeed, it was no animal, as the medical examiner Chuck Brackhart confirmed. See the zipper, he pointed. Go ahead, Chief of Police Sutton directed with a nod. Brackhart pulled the zipper and revealed the naked body of a young woman. My God, Sutton swore. We're going to have news people from all over the country down here. This'll put Wapshock Falls on the map, Brackhart muttered gloomily. It's already on my map, Sutton looked at his colleague, whom he didn't like very much, like a man contemplating the, co the offspring of, like a man contemplating the offspring of sin and treason. You recognize her? Brackhart looked up at the chief. Sutton took a closer look. His mouth fell open. My God, he gasped. That's Nancy Burke. Brackhart's eyes flew back to the coop. To the, Brackhart, <laughs> Brackhart's eyes flew back to the corpse, then back to Sutton. Hudson Burke's daughter? The one that was in the, uh... He snapped his fingers, trying to recall what he had heard about the young woman. He had only been in Wapshock Falls about a year. That clothing catalog, Cat Chief Chutton supplied the missing information. Yep. She was right famous around here. Brackhart examined the body. Searching for signs of injury, he ran his fingers through the hair at the nape of the neck. Chief, he said with momentous emphasis. What is it? Sutton could tell something bad was coming. There's another zipper. What? Brackhart pulled at the second zipper, which ran down the length of the spine to the natal cleft. He gently opened the skin sack and revealed what anyone who had read, read Pleat Mathis's previous books could have predicted, a multitude of small mechanical creatures connected by their toes to the superstructure of the maternal craft. Jesus! Cret Sutton cried. He carried no gun, so he scrabbled for one of the scalpels on a nearby tray. Stop! Put that down! Brackhart threw up his hands. They're dead! They're dead! Sutton's breath came hard as he slowly lowered the blade. He had quit smoking ten years before, yet he still suffered its effects. Maybe he should start riding a bicycle, riding it out into the sandy, stunted, pine-dotted emptiness that surrounded Wapshock Falls on all sides. Maybe he could find a barrel full of death and mystery of notoriety. Burkhart sat heavily down on his corner stool, wondering not for the first time why Wapshock Falls was called Wapshock Falls. Selected Mathras in order to frame his new story, Pleat Mathras invented the character of Clark Seville, an agent with a suggestible trapezoid. This character would serve as a link between the disparate elements that had made up Pleat's lost manuscript. He later told his friends that the character Seville had just come to him, although it is likely that he was influenced by reports of the adventures of agents like Seville that he had read about in the underground periodicals he was privy to. It was, if, it was as if the spirit of this man, Seville, had materialized in my chamber one night, Fleet recounted. I could almost feel him standing behind me, behind me as I wrote, wrote what he more or less dictated to me. His friends exchanged glances. Who was Fleet trying to kid? That was the same line that Robert E. Howard had spun about the creation of Conan. Save it for the public, they said. What, you don't think it sounds plausible? Fleet demanded, following them out of the room. Left behind on his desk lay the manuscript of... Plate's new narrative. In it, Seville had been was ordered back to his headquarters following in it Seville was ordered back to headquarters following the debacle on the moon. He'd been told to report to the new chief of Section Six. This turned out to be Cooler McCrud. Good to see you, Clark. McCrud, looking if possible even handsomer than ever, extended a hand to Seville and invited him to take a seat. Seville did so, reflecting inwardly that it wouldn't be long before the soft life told on McCrud's appearance. He'll get fat, Seville told himself. He'll indulge himself. Allow me to indulge myself, McCrud began as he opened a thick file before him. There's a lot in here I didn't know. He thumbed through a couple of dozen pages before commenting. You've had quite a few close shaves over the years. An extremely successful career, I'd say, especially considering your disadvantages at the start. He closed the file. I'm speaking, of course, of the time you had to spend undergoing transmorphosis. For most of us, the first two years were spent at the Academy. True, Seville replied calmly. You didn't, though, did you? You entered the trapezoid with full accreditation. Well, McCrud smiled. I knew what I wanted to be quite early. Now, he held up a hand, let's not get off on the wrong foot. I know we've had our differences in the past, but I want us to start this new relationship on a positive note, on the basis of mutual respect. Do you have an assignment for me? Seville asked, almost pleasantly, with even the shadow of a smile around his eyes, as if the question was a natural follow-up to McCrud's statement. McCrud's face, however, fell. 
He looked into, into Seville's eyes for a moment before replying. As a matter of fact, I do, he said. He pushed Seville's file to one side and replaced it with another of equal size. This, he said, is the Nancy Burke file. Seville tensed to the name. May I see that, he said in a low, heavy voice. Well, McCrud demurred. This file is classified above your level, but you are authorized to see these edited highlights. He passed a couple of stapled pages across to Seville. The big man glanced through them. These are from the Lost Mathras manuscript, he announced, tossing the pages onto the desk. The... What are you talking about? McCrud sounded, tried to sound convincing, but he was so taken aback that his immaculate facade faltered for a moment. You're the one who stole the manuscript, Seville stated flatly, rising from his chair. You've been using it to advance your career. He unbuttoned his coat. I'm going to have to correct things. You stupid ox. How? McCrud started to say something, but whether it was threat, explanation, justification, denial, or insult would never be known. Seville didn't care what he had to say. He leaped over the desk with the grace and power of a murderous ballet dancer. McCrud, though one of the most highly trained agents in the suggestible trapezoid, didn't even have the chance to wonder at just how superior Seville was in all respects, how superior he had always been, and how he, McCrud, had never even suspected this fact. After a few moments, Pleat Mathras returned to the room and retrieved his manuscript with a satisfied smile on his face. Soon enough... Why is it so important to you to finish this book? Jerry asked me as we made our way back to town through the woods. That's a stupid question. I kept my eyes open. I was looking for the ruins of the Macaw people village. There should be an entrance to the tunnels there. It's important that I write a real book, a long, unified narrative, at least once in my life. Death is looming, Jerry, whether I really believe in my own death or not. Yeah, agreed Jerry, whose own non-existence is linked with mine. But my point is, you seem to have put everything else on hold. Your music, your comics, your painting. Can we talk about this some other time, Jerry? But we've got nothing but time, Jerry thought sulkily. I thought that was the, your whole philosophy. Soon enough, we did come across what was left of the village. I poked around the ceremonial altar until I found the entrance to the tunnels. What sort of religion do the Macaque people practice? asked my imaginary friend. One in which every aspect of life was imbued with symbolic importance. It would have it would have been something I it would have been something I could dig if I was if it was specific to the individual, but no, like all religions, it was for the group. You don't like unity, do you? Life is experienced through the through the individual, not through the group. The people who think the digital the, think that the people who think the digital singularity is going to bring brotherhood and all that shit are going to find out find that out one day. Instead of billions of minds communing in peace and understanding, they're going to get one digital mind, lonely as hell, literally hell. Is procurement a religion? Jerry asked as I opened the tunnel entrance. It was disguised as a large rock. No. It's a system of thought, because it has no intention of bringing together everyone into one viewpoint, and no belief in the supernatural. Now, down in the tunnels, we stopped talking. I was happy to stop. Explaining things was stupid. Look at George Lucas. The more he showed us the inner workings of his world, the more boring it got. The walls of the tunnels were dark purple. As if the, the walls of the tunnels were dark purple, as was the carpet. The pictures on the walls every 30 feet or so were of lighthouses, owls, and pineapples. Why, where are we going exactly, Jerry asked as I examined the door. A door. Back to the bed and breakfast. I've still got to steal those books before it's all over. You'll never read them. I might. Are they in German? No, I hissed, opening the door. But don't forget, I'm still looking for something. I don't think I'll ever find it. Maybe I'll never, ever, never, ever be able to write it myself. But I'm looking for something that I really enjoy reading. Something like Robert Benchley, but science fiction. And in something appro approximating a longer and fictional narrative. I think you're crazy. Shh. I held my finger to my lips. We crawled out of, the, of a waste paper basket in my room in the inn. I'll sneak downstairs and fill up my valise with books. You see if there's anything in the rooms up here worth taking. I had just finished my task. My valise held such titles as A Ground, My Sweaty Cheese Wandering the Black Stack, Devout, per, per, pre, devout Predecessor Hailing Squalid from Afar, and Selection Indeed Brainstorms for, for the Hackle. When I was greeted by Colin Interston, the manager of the inn, Ah, Mr. Toad's Gabode, he hailed me in the hallway that led from the great room to the lobby. Are you enjoying your stay? Certainly, I smiled back. I'm looking forward to your lecture. My lecture? On the connection between surrealistic techniques and books and painting. Ah, you mean surrealistic? I corrected the man. 
on the connection between surrealist techniques in books and painting. Ah, you mean surrealistic, I corrected the man.